Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, de-escalation, a global effort to avoid war in Eastern Europe. French President Emmanuel Macron now saying Russia's Vladimir Putin assured him of no further escalation on the Ukrainian border. But what does the Kremlin have to say about it? We've got team coverage across the region this morning. Before the riot, the January 6th committee looking at the bigger picture this morning. Multiple sources telling NBC News the House committee is now focusing in on rallies and events as far back as a year before the insurrection. So what are they looking for? Plus, a critical rebuke of party rhetoric on the riot from the Senate's top Republican. And there it is. New this morning, Team USA's first gold in Beijing now belongs to snowboard cross legend Lindsay Jacob Ellis. Redemption after coming up painfully short in past games. Plus, Sean White, Chloe Kim now moving on to medal runs after some nail-biting qualifying sessions on the half pipe. All you need to know from Beijing this morning. Who we are as Black History Month marches on, we're going to take a critical look at the history of racism in America dating back to our founding. Our conversation with the subject of a glaring new documentary and who believes that America is once again at a social tipping point. And Pot Pop, a marijuana boom in one of the reddest states in the nation inside Oklahoma's budding green market that's got Sooner State regulators gasping for air. Mm. See what that that's spreading around the country? Now mm-hmm. we're seeing it in some places that we didn't think we would see it maybe a few years ago. And I saw what you just did there. <laughs> no pun. There we go. Bad green. <laughs> we begin this morning with more on those diplomatic efforts to pull back from the brink of war in Eastern Europe. Yeah, yesterday, French President Emmanuel Macron appeared to signal some positivity from his meeting with Russia's Vladimir Putin. Speaking alongside the Ukrainian president, Macron said Putin had assured him Russia would not escalate the crisis any further. Meanwhile, Russia says it has deployed its air defense system at a training ground in Belarus as part of preparations for large-scale military exercises. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is in eastern Ukraine for us this morning, and NBC News reporter Matt Bodner is in Moscow. Thank you both for being with us, my two Matt Bs. I will be directing questioning with first and last name to keep this as straight as possible. Matt Bradley, let's start with you in Ukraine and talk about the impacts of these comments from the French president. I mean, have they helped to soothe any concerns in Ukraine of an imminent Russian invasion? Yeah, well, Joe and Savannah, one thing I got to make clear, there weren't really any tensions to soothe. That's the thing. When you're walking around here, and even with the Ukrainian government, I'm sure maybe behind closed doors, it's a little different. But as I've been saying time and time again, it's one of the more bizarre, baffling aspects of this whole thing. It's just how untense these people are, uh, especially in um, especially the people around Zelensky. They just don't seem uh, to be that pressed. So again, there wasn't really any tensions to soothe. But at the same time, it didn't help that even after Macron said that, that we heard from Dmitry Peskov, he's uh, the spokesperson for the Kremlin, he poured cold water on all of that. Almost everything uh, was denied immediately after Macron said it. So th- this is a really interesting thing um, that uh, you know we're hearing talking out of both sides of their mouths diplomatically. When Macron made it here, he spoke with Zelensky. The only thing it seems like that was actually accomplished in this shuttle diplomacy between Kiev and Moscow was a very tenuous, very, very light commitment by both Moscow and Kiev to returning to the prospect of talks around the Minsk agreements. And that Minsk agreements, they were something that were agreed upon by all of the parties, but never really implemented because no one could agree again on what they actually meant, even though all the parties had, you know, presumably signed off on them. So this is almost a non-starter, and it's something that is going to be very difficult to move forward because all of these countries involved, and really by all of them, I really mean Russia and Ukraine, have different interpretations of a text that they mutually agreed to only a couple of years ago. So again, diplomacy here, one Once again, faltering, guys. Yeah, it really is something to hear about how calm it is on the ground. And Matt Bradley, you bring up something I now want to ask Matt Bodner about, which is the Kremlin's response here. What are you hearing on the ground in Russia? Thank you, Savannah. Well, as Matt Bradley said, they're kind of all over the place on this one. At the end of the day, either contradicting, denying, or downplaying every single positive gain that we have heard Macron and his team claim to have accomplished in Moscow. Just today at the Daily Kremlin press briefing, uh, Peskov said... 
there were positive signals, and he kind of defined that as, as, as an understanding that the only way forward in Ukraine is a, is an, a strict implementation of the Minsk II agreements, so does that uh, that ceasefire that Russia wants to see Ukraine implement. Ukraine has been dragging uh, its feet on. And he also remarked that uh, at that press conference yesterday between Macron and Zelensky, the Kremlin didn't see anything that indicated that the Ukrainians are prepared to, to uh, as the Russians would say, fulfill their obligations. And as for any kind of agreement with Macron on the sidelines here between the Kremlin uh, and, 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 and Paris, it's, uh, we, we actually heard a very sharp statement from Dmitry Peskov saying that such a thing could not be possible because France is a member of NATO. They're not the lead member of NATO, the implication there being that that is the United States. And so, therefore, none of these agreements that we've heard about could even be possible. Yeah, Matt Bradley, now let's talk about what's happening on the ground there in Ukraine with military aid. I mean, it continues to arrive in the country from the U.S. and other Western allies. But is it enough, I mean, at all for any potential confrontation with Russia? Or is Ukraine still so far behind? Yeah, I mean, Ukraine's military is better than it was in 2014, but we're talking about a really, really poorly funded, poorly equipped, poorly trained military back then. And that was back when Russia first invaded and the military essentially dissolved in the face of that aggression. And instead, what we saw were volunteer forces coming up and they played a crucial role in taking back. Uh, some of the some of the land that uh, the Russians and Russian-backed separatists had taken in those uh, early days of that fighting. But remember, that fighting was technically still going on. And while the military has gotten a lot better in terms of its ground forces, it just doesn't have the capability in air and in sea, which means that the Russians will probably be able to attack very effectively and with devastating force in the opening hours and days of this conflict, or in this potential conflict, I should say, uh, and really destroy what resources are available to the Ukrainians, maybe even before they enter the country. Guys? Yeah, Matt Bradley, you mentioned air and sea. So Matt Bodner, as we mentioned earlier, Russia has deployed more military hardware to Belarus as part of its ongoing exercises. That's that air defense system. We also saw Russian warships head to the Black Sea for drills. Are these increased military movements ultimately a sign that diplomacy isn't working? I mean, does Moscow feel like it's just not being heard here and they're continuing to push forward? What does this mean? Well, this is really the big question. So as you mentioned, Russian warships now in the Black Sea specifically, these are Russian landing ships that some suspect might actually be loaded essentially with Russian Marines, naval infantry. And so you have to ask yourself, what, what is this for? What is their intention here? At the same time, Russia continues to pick up the phone when foreign leaders call and they, they want to have these meetings. So I think really what we're seeing here uh, probably could be described as coercive diplomacy. Russia is willing to talk, but it's been, you know, if you look at the details, what they want to talk about is a strict implementation of their demands. Mm -hmm. And then while they're not getting those demands, they continue to beef up their forces. So I think things will become a lot clearer later this month. Tomorrow begins the, uh, the formal part of that big exercise in Belarus. And if it's scheduled to end on February 20th. If they pull those troops back then, we might have a better idea of where this is going. But that, that's kind of the big, the big date to watch now. All right. Matt Bodner in Russia. Matt Bradley in Ukraine. Thank you both for your reporting from the ground. A shift in New York's mask mandate policy could be on the horizon. Governor Kathy Hochul is expected to announce a major change in the state's stance on mask mandates later today. New York's statewide mask mandate expires tomorrow. It's a policy the governor put in place two months ago to help stop the spread of Omicron. She's set to address some of the biggest contentions with the mandate, including whether masks should be required in the classroom. At least four other states have already announced plans to lift their school mandates. Oregon, Delaware, Connecticut, and New Jersey. California is also relaxing its mask policies as of next week. Dr. Ali Raja joins us now with more on this. Dr. Raja is a professor of emergency medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Good to have you with us. So what are some of the factors that help decide whether it is safe to remove mask mandates? And if you, as, as a person, can't control whether people around you have to wear a mask, what other tools do we have to protect ourselves? Joe, that's a great question. There's obviously a lot that goes into this. We've seen hospitalizations start to come down, which is great. We've seen cases start to come down as well. The thing to remember, though, is that while we're coming down from this Omicron surge, we still have numbers that rival some of the surges that we saw last year as well. So we're on the way down, but the numbers are still pretty high. The CDC data still shows high rates of transmission of Omicron or of COVID throughout the country. So masks are still going to be really helpful. But you bring up such an important point. 
I've been talking to my patients about this too, is that as these mask mandates start to go away, that doesn't mean that you can't still wear a mask, especially if you're older or have other medical problems that put you at risk. So even if your state's mask mandate goes away, remember, you can still wear a mask. Let's talk about vaccines. Johnson & Johnson says it will temporarily stop making its COVID vaccine. What could be the impact of this? Should we be worried at all? You know, it's a great question. Here's the thing about the J&J &J vaccine. We don't see as much of it used in the U.S., but it's fewer shots than the other vaccines. And most importantly, it doesn't require all of the really cold refrigeration that the other vaccines do, which makes it really, really important for the developing world that doesn't have all the resources in place. And so if we want to try to mitigate the development of new, um, if of new variants in the future and prevent the next Omicron, the next Pi, whatever it is, we really need to get this J&J &J vaccine out again. So I'm hoping it's just a temporary stoppage. And of course, that is so important in preventing the next variant, as you mentioned. So finally, doctor, a new study out of the UK shows a quarter of employees are not working because of long COVID. So what does this tell us about the impact of COVID on our health system beyond just current hospitalization numbers? And might we expect the same thing here in the U.S. when it comes to long COVID? We probably should, Joe. Here's the thing. We don't it, we don't really know exactly how to recognize long COVID. It's likely under recognized and we're likely going to be seeing a lot more of it in the future since we're still learning about the symptoms that we can attribute, the, the pulmonary symptoms, the respiratory symptoms, the, the neurologic symptoms. There are a bunch of things that we are starting to attribute to long COVID. So the main thing to take away from this is this is why I tell my patients not to just try to get Omicron, to get COVID over with for themselves or their kids. You want to try to avoid this as long as possible because we don't know how big an issue long COVID is really going to be. Such an important point there. Dr. Ali Raja, as always, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And if you, our viewers, have a question for one of our doctors, you can let us know. They are ready to answer those questions. You can email us at morningnewsnow at NBCUNI.com. And please let us know if you want to stay anonymous. Now to some big news on Capitol Hill. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell broke ranks with the Republican National Committee, forcefully calling the events of January 6th a, quote, violent insurrection. It comes as we're learning more about and from the ongoing investigation into that attack. Lawyers working for the House panel are looking back as far as a year before the riot, trying to determine if the extremist groups that stormed the Capitol had a broader network of planning. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now with this. Hey, Ken, good morning. So NBC News spoke to six of these investigators who asked to remain anonymous. But what events are they focusing on and why? What do we know? Hey, Savannah. Yeah, this is some really interesting reporting by our colleague Ben Collins, who himself is an expert in far right groups. And what these investigators told him is that they are scrutinizing events attended by these far right militias, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, going back as far as a year before January 6th, including protests against COVID lockdowns, protests against racial justice demonstrations, to see whether there were any uh, signs and signals of cooperation long before January 6th. To look at this more holistically as a movement. And, and let's not forget, they have a different mandate than the Justice Department. These investigators are trying to get to the truth here to publish a report. They can talk to people who aren't in criminal jeopardy, uh, who may not may or may not be possible defendants or witnesses in the Justice Department investigation, just to get to the truth of why this happened. And the chief investigator for the January 6th committee also was hired to do a report on what happened with the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. I've read that report. It was a comprehensive look at what took place there, uh, not only the activities of those far-right groups, but also the failures on behalf of the government, which is also something the January 6th committee is looking at uh, in, in terms of what the FBI and DHS failed to see. Guys. So, Ken, tell us now, we have, they're, they're investigating the actual events of January 6th, but now we're also talking about how there's this focus on how extremist coalitions formed before the riot and then have evolved in the years since. Kind of walk us through those two lines of investigation and then what's been found so far on each. Yeah, well, one of the things that they're finding is that a lot of these groups had uh, one particular strain of extremist thought in common, which was the great replacement theory, the notion that somehow there's a conspiracy to replace white people with uh, members of minority groups uh, in voting blocks and in and, and centers of power around the United States, a racial resentment that seemed to have pervaded a lot of the groups 
But I think there's some open questions, really. They, they haven't gotten the answers yet to how coordinated were these particular groups, and specifically to the answer of was there actually a plan in advance to take the Capitol? Because even in the latest indictment of Oath Keepers leader Stuart Rhodes, which where the Justice Department revealed the most it's ever said about this, they have not explicitly said there was a, a specific conspiracy, a plan in advance to attack the Capitol, guys. Now, Ken, earlier this week, the Department of Homeland Security issued a domestic terrorism advisory. Tell us about that and exactly specifically what they're saying about the threat of misinformation right now that this has to do with. Yeah, this document reiterated what they've been saying all year, really, which is that there is an incredible climate of misinformation and disinformation on social media right now, exacerbating the social tensions in the United States, vaccine conspiracy, anti-government rhetoric, and it's being amplified by our foreign adversaries, Russia, China, Iran, even North Korea. They are playing in that space and trying to divide Americans. And what officials tell me is that they're really worried that this is fomenting a climate of extremism and violence. It only takes one or two disturbed people to look at this mm. stuff and take action and do something really bad, guys. Only one or two disturbed people. Wow. Kendall and Ian, thank you so much. Let's now get a check on your morning news now, weather. Bill Cairns is with us again. Bill, good morning. Good morning, guys. I'd say about 95% of the country has really nice weather today mm -hmm. in this February thaw. And the one spot that doesn't is normally where it's gorgeous. I mean, South Florida today is kind of cool and chilly. It's kind of rainy. Not the best weather at the beaches, obviously. And that's where we take you to the radar. It looks like in Miami, probably have about another hour, and then it's going to pour as that rain will move on through. You can see there right now it's over the Everglades, that yellow and even a little bit of red. No lightning with this, but there are some local downpours. And again, it'll just be kind of cloudy and cool for much of the day. So there's Miami. And when we're saying cool in Miami, it's still going to be 70 degrees. So it's not like horrible. But look at all the sunshine across the board today. Uh, D.C. is going to be great. We're melting snow from Boston to New York. Still a little chilly in the Great Lakes. That's where winter is holding on. And out west, it's unbelievably warm. And into Thursday, that continues. Notice that the only chilly spot, it continues to be the Great Lakes. A little bit of snow shower activity possible from Minneapolis to Green Bay. New York City should be 50 degrees on Thursday. And everyone in the south is pretty comfortable, too, in the 60s. So let's talk about the upcoming weekend forecast, Super Bowl weekend. Still sunny and nice on Friday. No problems on the eastern seaboard. Uh, Great Lakes hold on to your snow showers and record warmth continues in the west. 70s as far north as the Oregon coastline. Uh, even Portland up near 60 degrees. Saturday, a cold blast. You know, it's still winter. We're going to get a cold shot or two. We're not done with winter yet. And another cold blast will come down into the central uh, plains and the northern plains. High temperatures only in the teens and single digits in some spots with snow squalls. And then on Sunday, for Super Bowl Sunday, Obviously, super warm in the west, temperatures in the 80s. In the east, we're going to have a little bit of light snow. At this point, I'm going to call this mood flakes, guys. I'm not going to call this a snowstorm. It looks like there should be some snow falling. The ground temperatures may be warm enough that it melts when it hits the road. So I call those mood flakes. They don't really interfere with anything. It just kind of looks pretty and puts you in a good mood. Hashtag oh, mood flakes. Let's get that going. That. Let's get that trend. Looks pretty. You like that? I want t mood. Should we do t-shirts, hats? Yeah. Yes. Mood flakes, mood hats. Flakes. All right. But Bill, now next time, can't we get that on the map instead of where it says light snow? Can you put mood flakes? <laughs> I think, but if anyone was if anyone was muted, they would be really confused. Well, really then they went on mute. That seems they like the mute. perfect reason to do it. They should be <laughs> listening to the news we're bringing them. All right, Thank thanks, you. Phil. That's, that's right. <laughs> All right, to the Olympic Games, where Team USA scored its first gold medal with Lindsay Jacob Ellis's wire-to-wire -wire win in the snowboard cross event. Team USA picked up several other medals yesterday and now sits in seventh place overall in the medal standings. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz is back with us to tell us the latest from Beijing. Gotti, good morning. So let's talk some more about Lindsay Jacob Ellis's big win. So we know it's Team USA's first gold medal in the Games, but it's also her first gold medal for this athlete. How important was it for her and Team USA to get the monkey off their back, so to speak, when it comes to this gold medal? 
Uh, yeah, so Vanny, you want to talk about Olympic monkeys. This is going to be hopefully one that gets an Olympic monkey, monkey off of Lindsay Jacob Ellis's back that she's had since 2006 because mm. uh, 16 years ago, Jacob Ellis was crushing it at the Olympics. She was winning by a long shot. So uh, she took a little celebratory board grab that caused her to crash right before the finish line in a video that has just been played over and over oh. again. But uh, she said that that mistake made in 2006 uh, has driven her forward. She has now become the biggest force in the sport, and now she has finally clinched that gold in Beijing, oh. giving Team USA its first medal. That's, I love Sarah, that. That is so great. All right, let's talk about what was heading into these games, one of the best stories, and now during the games is an even better story. That's Colby yeah. Stevenson picking up a silver medal in improbable fashion during the men's free ski big air final. What more can you tell us about this event and really about Stevenson's really mm -hmm. amazing journey to even get to the Olympics this year? Yeah, Joe, this silver medal is so astounding, and here is why. Back in 2016, uh, Colby Stevenson came inches uh, to mm. death when his car crash uh, ended up resulting in him cracking his skull in over mm. 40 places. He broke his neck. He broke his ribs, uh, his eye socket. It was a miracle that he survived. Then mm. uh, he went through a brutal recovery. He has come back with a vengeance. Uh, and, and this event was a close one. Now, remember, in freestyle big air, you do three runs. Only the best two count. Well, Colby started out a little rough, but then in the last two, he totally sent it. His second and third run finishing with a switch double cork uh, 1800 which is five rotations two flips it's a type of uh, oh trick that is so insane to see that you just think like how did that happen what happened it was so big so <laughs> fast how do judges even tell how many times he rotated yes. uh, big silver medal win. oh my gosh I'm so happy that you said that that's how I feel how can they even judge how can they tell what just happened I mean I think they have that technology where they slow it down but it's still just so amazing okay Gotti here's some interesting news the Olympic Committee announced they're going to be delaying the medal ceremony for team figure skating due to a, quote, emerging issue, according to an Olympic spokesperson. What does that mean? Uh, yeah, this one's tough because the International Olympic Committee is being very vague about what's made them halt this extremely watched medal ceremony. This is one of the biggest events in Winter Games, uh, and the plans for the ceremony have basically come to a screeching halt with no further date given. And all the uh, IOC has said so far is that it is a legal issue that has arisen that could affect the medalist, not saying who or the nature of the legal issue. So here's what we do know right now. The ROC won goal. The United States won silver and Japan won bronze. But if you're wondering what the ROC is, that is the Russian Olympic Committee, which is what Russian athletes are competing after after Russia was banned from official representation as punishment for a state involved doping scandal. But again, at this point, the IOC has said nothing about the latest legal issue uh, that has halted that ceremony. They have not said who it involves. But if one of the medalists, the ROC, Team USA or Japan were to lose the medal, then Canada would step up to third place. But again, still no word on when we might know uh, with the IOC only saying that sometimes legal issues can drag on. So we'll see. Ah, wow. Awesome. The, yeah. The plot thickens. All right. Wow. A lot to unpack there. Okay. Gotti Schwartz, thank you so much. Yeah. Another major headline this morning is Team USA's Jesse Diggins, who just won a bronze medal in cross-country skiing. Well, it's her second Olympic medal. Jesse is the first American to win an individual women's medal in cross-country skiing. Joining us now is the woman herself, Jesse Diggins. Jesse, congrats on that medal. Yay! Thank you for being with us. How does it feel to make history for Team USA? Oh, it's been really overwhelming, but in a good way. Um, I just got back from the medal ceremony, and it was so special to have some teammates and coaches and staff outside right there. Um, I got to wave hi to them, and that was so special because we really did this as a team. It's taken so much from so many people to make this happen, and so I'm I'm really excited to uh, to call my fiance and my family and show them this tonight. <laughs> Let's talk more about that team. I mean, when you won right after you talked about how many people it took yeah. to get you here, tell us more about this team and, and who it was who got you here. 
Yeah, well, starting with my family, um, they got me into skiing and my fiance who has supported me through so many ups and downs. I mean, this has been a hard year between COVID and a lot of uh, stress and pressure and expectations that have been put on my shoulders. He's just been there with unconditional love and support every step of the way. Um, and then this team is amazing because even though a lot of our races are individual events, you don't do something like that alone ever. And we have amazing competitive skis because we have a whole team of wax techs who are out there for hours before the race, testing every possible combination and application of wax for our skis. So every time you see us race, you have to know that there is a whole staff of people who have mm. made it possible for us to get to that start line with the skis that we have under our feet. And then having amazing coaches and teammates who get us through training. I mean, we train twice a day, six days a week from May through November. And then we're on the road November through March. So we really become this tight knit sort of family unit because you have to be able to lean on each other to get through that kind of training and time on the road. So I'm just so grateful for them and for their support because having amazing teammates who push you to be your best and then support you through your hard days. That's how you create that kind of momentum. Wow. And twice a day, six days a week. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Now, Jesse, let's kind of just put this in context with your legacy. So we mentioned a minute ago that this isn't your first Olympic medal. It's also not your first historic win. Back at the 2018 Winter Olympics, you and your teammate, Keegan Randall, won the first ever gold medal for the U.S. in cross-country skiing. That was also the first American medal in the sport since 1976. And as we mentioned a moment ago, this medal now is the first American to win an individual for women's in cross-country skiing. I mean, when you think about all that, what do you hope that this sort of does? Think about your legacy in paving the way for young American skiers, these, these records that you've broken, this history that you've made. Honestly, I think the most important legacy I can leave behind is what I do off the snow. Um, I speak a lot about the eating disorder that I overcame when I was 18, 19 years old. And I think it's so important to recognize that the only reason I'm here and competing and healthy and happy, most importantly, is because I was able to ask uh, for help and able to let in the people who love me, um, let mm. them into my life and let them help me. And because my family was there for me. And so I think, um, I guess my most important legacy is that if anyone out there seeing this is struggling with something, know that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to not be perfect because I think it's so important to recognize that even the people you see on TV winning Olympic medals, they have ups and downs. They have vulnerabilities. They're not perfect. And so you don't have to be perfect to be okay. And I think that's the most important thing. It's, it's not this, this is really, really cool. And I'm really <laughs> happy about it, but that's not the most important thing that I leave behind when I retire someday. We're back with more on a stunning letter from former Pope Benedict. He's asking for forgiveness after investigation into sexual abuse by priests who reported to him decades ago when he was a cardinal in Germany. Now, the 94-year-old is also maintaining his innocence, though. Here's NBC News correspondent Tom Costello with more. From Rome, former Pope Benedict's personal secretary. Reading Benedict's request for forgiveness amid allegations he failed to take decisive action against abusers decades ago. The Pope Emeritus denying any personal wrongdoing, insisting he only served as Archbishop of Munich for less than five years in the late 70s and 80s, but acknowledging mistakes in how abuse cases were handled, offering his heartfelt request for forgiveness. I have had great response responsibilities in the Catholic Church, he writes. All the greater is my pain for the abuses and the errors that occurred in those different places during the time. Benedict's letter follows an independent German investigation that found then-Cardinal Ratzinger failed to act against four abusive priests in Munich. Some survivors of clerical abuse say the letter isn't enough. How quickly he wanted to demonstrate that he was only an administrator in Munich for less than five years, almost to say this wasn't my problem. Benedict's attorneys insist at the time he did not know about the predator priest's criminal histories in Munich. In the letter today, he speaks about 
the fact that quite soon he believes he will be at judgment's door and he personally feels clear of conscience. Nine years after retiring, a still evolving and controversial legacy. Tom Costello, NBC News. Let's take a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. Ali Aruzi is back with us from Tehran. Hey, Ali. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joe. Secretary Blinken has flown down under to Australia for a three-day visit where he'll meet with his Australian, Japanese and Indian counterparts who form a part of the so-called quad bloc of Indo-Pacific democracies created to counter China. It'll be the fourth such ministerial meeting. Blinken's arrival makes him the most senior member of the Biden administration to set foot in Australia. The Colombian Navy have seized a submarine full of cocaine in the South Pacific. The submarine, with four people on board, was heading for the Central American coast with four tons of cocaine stashed inside it with a street value of around $150 million. When the 50-foot vessel was searched by Navy commandos, they found 200 sacks full of cocaine. Despite decades of drug wars, Colombia remains one of the world's top cocaine producers. A treasure trove of archaeological objects allegedly looted from Iraq has made its way back to Baghdad after a Lebanese museum returned the artifacts, which include more than 300 cuneiform tablets. They are among the thousands of antiquities recovered over the last year by Iraq, soon to be presented to the public, according to Iraq's Minister of Culture. And those are your headlines, guys. All right, Ali, thank you so much. Thanks, Ali. For Dollywood employees, working nine to five just got a whole lot sweeter. <laughs> Hershend Enterprises operates the theme park inspired by Dolly Parton and its related resorts. The company announced it will cover 100% of tuition fees and books for employees who want to further their education. The incentive is being offered through a pilot program called Grow You, which officially launches on February 24th. Seasonal, part-time, and full-time employees can sign up starting on their very first day on the job. Dollywood president said in a quote, when our hosts strive to grow themselves, it makes our business and our community mm -hmm. a truly better place. So Dolly and everyone around Dolly sharing the love as always. Yeah, well, I mean, I know. Thank you to our chief Dolly Parton. <laughs> uh, love that. And I've got work in nine to five. So there, you go. Head. there, there we you go. go. All right. Thank you, Joe. That's <laughs> yeah. great news, though. Very cool. All right. Now we've loved spotlighting documentaries and their filmmakers here on Morning News Now. And today we have a really important one. It's called Who We Are, a Chronicle of Racism in America. Here's a little peek. We had been on a path toward racial justice that was amazing. There was the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. We were at a tipping point. We're 50 years later now. Once again, America is having to look at issues of race dead in the eye. And once again, we are at a tipping point. And the question for all of us in this room is, what are we going to do about it? This morning, we're joined by co-directors Emily and Sarah Kunzler and the documentary Central Storyteller, the founder and CEO of the Who We Are Project and former ACLU Deputy Legal Director Jeffrey Robinson, who you just heard there in that trailer. Good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And actually, that trailer goes on to say America was founded on white supremacy. That's something that our audience did not just get to hear there. And I just want to talk with all of you about how you all met and decided to take on such a huge topic in this this film it was even mentioned right after that in this trailer. You know, that might be a controversial statement, but go look at it. So let's talk about how you all did that. Emily, I'll start with you and that question on tackling this huge topic. Sure. Um, Sarah had an opportunity to see Jeff speak um, at, a, at a courthouse in downtown New York and was blown away, um, called me and um, we, we decided to reach out to Jeff to see how we could get his really powerful presentation um, that changed the way that we both looked at the world out to as many people as possible. Mm. So we met with Jeff, um, and luckily he he agreed to take us along this ride with him. Um, and we traveled the country with him as he gave this presentation and and made this film. And this is a presentation that Jeffrey has been giving was giving for ten years before mm. we met him. So this project has its genesis in Jeff's work. 
Mm, absolutely. Now, Jeffrey, we heard you say there in this trailer that after the progress of the civil rights movement, we've started to backtrack as a country. And you say that we're at this tipping point when it comes to race in America. Explain that tipping point. What exactly do you see on either side of that point? <clears throat> I see a decision on which way America is going to go looking at the gaps between white America and black America in virtually every socioeconomic measure that you can, the question becomes, why? Why does this gap exist? And I believe a serious part of our problem in America is that we have not dealt with the truth about our history that will give a significant explanation to these gaps. And it's not the explanation that many people think. So the truth literally is going to set all of us free. And that's what we're talking mm. about in this film. And Jeffrey, also at one point in the film, you mentioned that you had one of the best educations, basically, that you can get in America, but that you were still blown away by how much you didn't know. Tell us maybe something, a couple things that you were surprised to learn in this process. I think one of the things that surprised me the most was the clear debate that was going on at the Constitutional Convention when America went from colonial America to constitutional America. They put slavery right on the table mm -hmm. and all the money that the colonies uh, made from it. And they had to decide, what are we going to do? Because we're saying life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the letters written by the founding fathers have language in it that cannot be described as other than what language of so-called white supremacy. And they said, we're making a lot of money for this. And the Constitution doubled down on the institution of slavery. And I was very surprised by that. I'm sure a lot of viewers will be as well. Now, this film really looks at this duality of America as a great country, but also America as a racist country, Emily and Sarah, what do you want viewers to take away after they've watched your film and you're examining that? We want viewers to take away that this is our collective history, uh, black, white, people of all colors in this country, and it has been stolen from all of us. And that is, it is up to all of us together to get it back and reclaim it together. And this film um, is not a calling out it's a calling in. Mm. It's a, an invitation to a collective learning so together we can figure out how to be a better nation. Absolutely. Not a calling out, but a calling in. That's very, very powerful. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your time this morning and for sharing this super impactful, super important film with all of us. And congratulations on the film. Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America is out in select theaters right now. Thank you all again for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Bertha Coons is with us this morning. Hey, Bertha. Hey, good morning, Joe and Savannah. We've got uh, Toyota talking about the continuing problem with chip supply. It's cutting its annual production target by another $50,000 due to the ongoing shortage of semiconductor ship chips. The world's biggest automaker by sales reporting quarterly profits dropped more than 20% in its most recent quarter. Like its rivals, Toyota has been forced to cut output as the pandemic has disrupted global chip supply chains. That has forced it to cut costs in an attempt to freeze out or squeeze out rather more profit per vehicle. Meantime, Lyft's quarterly earnings topping Wall Street's forecast. Although the company says the number of active riders was lower than expected, Lyft is making more money per trip thanks largely to longer rides, many of which went to and from airports. Lyft says while the Omicron variant had a significant impact on demand, it expects that to recover soon, and it saw a pickup in rides at the end of January. Meantime, TikTok is updating its community guidelines, including cracking down on content for which the app has previously come under fire. Those include videos critics say glorify eating disorders and unhealthy habits such as short-term fasting and over-exercising. TikTok will also ban hateful ideology like misgendering, misogyny, and content promoting conversion therapy. TikTok says more than 90 million videos, about 1% of the videos uploaded to the service have been removed for content violations 
in the third quarter of last year. That's a lot of mm -hmm. videos. Yeah, 90 million is 1%. My goodness. Yeah. Wow. That's stunning. Good thing they're taking yeah. that action there, though. Yeah, Thank yeah you, Bertha. they've become the biggest. Yeah. yeah. All right, thanks, Bertha. And now it is time for your weekly checkup, where we discuss the latest health headlines that you might have missed. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now to break down some of these headlines. Dr. Azar, good morning. Let's start with e-cigarettes. They've been touted as useful aids to quit smoking. New research shows that may not be the <laughs> case. What more can you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. In the ongoing saga and controversy about whether or not e-cigarettes work to help smokers quit smoking, we have a new study that for the first time showed that e-cigarettes were less popular than other cessation uh, interventions like medications and things like that. But more importantly, it showed that e-cigarettes weren't really that effective at helping smokers quit. With about 60% of smokers who switched to e-cigarettes resumed smoking in the two-year study period. My doctor's orders are make a quit plan enlist the help of a counselor to do so. There are tons of medications that can help with smoking cessation. Really reducing environmental triggers are so important. Having other things to distract you and having other substitutes for cigarettes, maybe instead of the e-cigarette, for example, straws, chivalrous gum, other things to suck or chew on um, other than a cigarette. Mm, yeah, great, great advice there. Okay, now let's talk about a very, very popular topic among morning show anchors, sleep. <laughs> so it sounds like we need to get to bed a little bit earlier. I don't know how much earlier we can necessarily go to bed, but researchers at the University of Chicago found this link between more sleep and here it is, weight loss, specifically yes. how sleep duration could reduce our overall calorie intake. Walk us right. through this. Which that part's intuitive, right? If you're if you're sleeping more of the day, you're less likely to be eating during that part of the day. But the way I like to frame this is sleeping the right amount is kind of like a Goldilocks number. Too much sleep is actually not good for you. Mm. Too little sleep is definitely not good for you. So what they did, they had a, a bunch of overweight individuals. Half of them slept their normal amount, which is about less than six and a half hours per night. And the other half slept up to eight and a half hours. And what they found was that adding an hour or two of sleep actually allowed these individuals to shed up to 270 calories per day, which guess what? Equals to about 26 pounds of weight loss over a three-year period. So my doctor's orders are, yes, guess what? Our age group, the number really is seven to nine hours. You really do need to hit that eight hour a night mm. target for, for adequate sleep. And you need to practice good sleep hygiene. If you don't know what that is, Google it. There's a lot out there about how to help you sleep a more you know, restful, restorative night of sleep to help all of your body functions. Mm. Lose 26 pounds without exercising. I can see the headline there. Right? There you go, Joe. All right. Let's talk about how uh, changing your diet could help with life expectancy. That may not be surprising, but specifically, what did researchers find here? Right, exactly. So another one that seems kind of intuitive, if you're eating better, you're less likely to develop chronic disease and cancer, so you're probably less likely to die. But do we actually have data that supports that? So this is interesting. This wasn't a study that followed individuals for 50 years, but rather it was a modeling study that took databases from this place called the Global Burden of Disease Study, which actually tracks all of these reasons for death and disease and injuries, which is really kind of fascinating. And in this study, they basically modeled Modeled and predicted that if you change your diet in young adulthood, you could add up to a decade of extra life expectancy. And if you switch from a typical Western diet to that optimal diet by the age of 20, you had even the best results. So my doctor's orders are, what is this optimal diet? You're, you've heard this all before, everyone. You avoid too much red and processed meat. You want to add more plant-based proteins. You want legumes, nuts, whole grains. And guess what? It's never too late to change. Mm. Even though those gains in life expectancy went down as we got older, they were still there. So even if you're 80 years old, not too late to add a couple years to your life by changing your diet. So based on those doctor's orders there, I have a feeling you would recommend that bowl of fruit we showed and not the hot dog that was also uh, in that loop of photos there. Um, you got it. Doctor, let's end with some fascinating news on medical technology. This is pretty amazing. Three patients with complete spinal cord injuries were able to walk again. How'd that happen? This is remarkable. Mm. So, you know, for ever since 
ever since Superman, right? We, we've heard about these spinal cord injuries and how devastating they are because you es essentially sever the spinal cord at a certain level and suddenly you can't walk or move or anything like that. Well, they've taken the technology that we've had for a long time, spinal cord stimulation that has been used to treat pain because it attacks nerve receptors, and they have modified that technology to now be able to send electrical impulses to someone's muscles to allow them to move. You do this with, you know, an app or a smartphone. These people who've not been able to move their limbs are able to walk and with rehabilitation have been able to sort of come to some sort of level of, of normal ambulation. It is truly remarkable the way science and technology has allowed for all of these advances in medicine. Um, to me, it was just one of those things that kind of made my heart flutter because it's oh. so, so unbelievable. Mm, it really is. So neat to see. Dr. Natalie Azar, that was a great roundup today. Thank you so much. You bet. Take care. This morning, we are taking you to the heartland for an inside look at a cash crop that's rewriting the rules in real time. The marijuana industry has expanded in places you might expect, like California and Colorado, but new opportunities are now igniting a free market frenzy in Oklahoma. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky takes a look at the race to cash in as officials there try to keep up. It's not the kind of well-oiled machine you'd expect to see in Oklahoma. But make no mistake, folks here know a boom when they see one. We're in one of the reddest states in the country, standing in a room full of marijuana. Unbelievable. No one thought we would be here even three years ago, right? Including David Lewis, who left a job in staffing to form Stability Cannabis. Now, three years after the state legalized medical marijuana, more than 100 employees make sure their supply meets the surging demand. All it took to start? $2,500 for a license to grow with no cap on quantity. So about how many plants in this one room alone? About 3,000 cannabis plants in just this one room. And you'll have this on a store shelf how soon? In just about 90 days. Their customers, around 400,000 Oklahomans with medical marijuana cards, who can buy any cannabis product legally sold within state lines. Oklahoma now home to more than 2,000 marijuana dispensaries, more than Colorado, Oregon, even California. The draw? Ease of access and fewer regulations than competing states. We're witnessing the, the second Wild Wild West to California. Which is exactly why best friends Dustin Hyman and Django Evans traded California for Oklahoma to open the Roan Shop. Who are your customers? It's anyone from a school teacher to an ex-athlete to a corporate guy to an 80-year-old grandma. But the new green rush, not so cut and dry. The state agency tasked with regulating is struggling, telling us they've only been able to inspect about a quarter of the more than 9,000 licensed farms. We have not been able to keep up with the demand. Demand so high, quiet farm towns are finding this cash crop comes at a cost. Well, we're hearing a lot of stories in rural Oklahoma about the water resources overtaxed and overused, along with an immense uptick in the use of their electric grids. With Oklahoma cannabis on track this year to surpass a billion dollars in retail sales, lawmakers are proposing tighter rules and higher taxes. But with a business model other states are no doubt watching, it's clear this boom's taking root. Morgan Chesky, NBC News, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma has the highest per capita rate of medical marijuana use in the nation, which is helping the state bring in almost $500 million more in taxes compared to last. A newborn baby couldn't wait to make her debut, even as her dad competed halfway around the world at the Winter Olympics. As NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas explains, he can't wait to get home to the biggest prize of all. <laughs> We first met Olympian Leif Nordgren and his wife Caitlin last week, the day before Caitlin was due to give birth. She told us the minute they found out they were pregnant, they did the math. We knew, we were like, oh no, early February, that's not good. Caitlin is a meteorologist for NBC5 in Burlington, Vermont. Her husband, Leif, is an Olympic biathlete. You know that event where you ski and shoot. There are no good excuses to miss your child's birth, but qualifying for the Winter Olympics isn't half bad. Sacrifices are just a huge part of an athlete's life. And if two people can do this, Leaf and I are definitely those two people. Together, they decided Leaf wouldn't give up his Olympic dream. So on Sunday night, as Caitlin went into labor in Burlington, Leaf joined by video from Beijing. Together, Virtually, they welcomed little seven-pound, three-ounce Astrid into the world. 
it was really nice to be able to at least be there and talk to her a little bit, try to help her out as best I could. Um, it was still a, a very cool experience, even over over the phone. Leaf competed in his first race, admitting afterwards his mind was a little more focused on baby than the targets he was trying to nail during the biathlon. Obviously, I wish I could be there and and uh, get to get to hold Ostrid, but it'll be it'll be another week and a half or so, and we can kind of start the rest of our lives together. For now, Caitlin is trying to watch Leaf compete, but she's no longer in charge of the schedule. When she's hungry, she's hungry. She got really hungry, like right as the race was starting. But yeah, there was for sure some juggling this morning, but that will just be our what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> and what an adorable baby. A big congrats to the new parents, and thanks to Tom Yamas for that report. But this is for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now.